Good morning. Um, my name is Doug Johnson. I'm from National Demographics uh, Corporation or NDC. Um, and we've been uh, very busy with this all across the state. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll see me, sometimes you'll see my Vice President Justin Levitt, um, who you may be familiar with because he's the one who actually handled all the Palm Springs work and the Desert Healthcare Agency work. Um, we didn't work on Coachella, but we also did uh, Your Neighbor to the South Imperial Irrigation when they went through this process. So it is definitely spreading. And then, of course, we did uh, Cathedral City as well. So this is a, a, a very busy topic in the state right now. Uh, there you go. Um, your legal counsel covered the law very well. Just it, outside the legal context, what happened is we've had the Federal Voter Rights Act since 1965. Everyone's fairly well aware of that. There are four tests that you have to fail under the Federal Voter Rights Act before a plaintiff can force you into district elections. What the authors of the California law did is they took the two tests that they had actually lost a number of lawsuits based on, and they took them out. So now, instead of having to prove that, you're a, that the protected class can be a majority of the district, that's just a remedy issue now. And then the, the last one, the totality of circumstances this was a requirement in federal law that, that plaintiffs show that race is an issue, that people are voting either overtly or covertly based on race in some way. So they took that out. And so as your legal counsel mentioned, the law no longer has any need to show on the plaintiff's side any kind of discrimination, prejudice, anything like that. All they've left in place is this statistical analysis of voting patterns, um, which is useful, but it's got huge margins of error and estimation issues in it. But what, essentially what they did is they took it from four tests they had to pass as plaintiffs down to two and made it much, much easier for them to win cases. And this is sweeping the state. In the top left, you can see 175 school districts have switched, uh, 29 community college districts that we know of. I think there's a couple we haven't talked to. Um, we're over 100 cities. We're actually, I think we're over 110 now. And to put that in context, before this law, there were only 29 cities in the state that had district elections. So in addition to this original 29, we've now added almost 110 of the 490 cities total in the state. So this is really sweeping. It says one county board of supervisors because there was only one left that wasn't by district. Uh, so San Mateo County was the last uh, holdout and they were sued and forced into change. And now lately, uh, special districts are the hotbed of this. Uh, I mentioned Desert Health. Um, down in San Diego, we've actually worked with four healthcare districts. We're working now with airport districts. Um, there's, the plaintiffs are really starting to get into just about anyone that uh, has an elected board. And the reason isn't that these 200 jurisdictions are violating anyone's civil rights or that they're discriminating against anyone. They're all switching because of the money. Uh, so the first big case where they actually read the merits was Palmdale. You've probably heard of this. They fought tooth and nail. They lost, and they had to pay the plaintiffs $4.7 million. Uh, Santa Clara recently fought. They tried to keep their expenses down, and they only spent about eight hundred grand on their defense, uh, whereas Palmdale had spent almost $2 million. And they lost, and um, the plaintiffs asked for $4.2 million, and the city won in getting that release reduced to only $3.2 million that they have to pay the plaintiffs. And Santa Monica is the big one. Um, they actually won't say how much they've spent on their defense. It's somewhere between five and eight million dollars just in the trial court and the preliminary motions. So, and, and nobody's won a case, so there's no path that your legal counsel can point to of, oh, this is what we have to do to show we're not in violation of this so we can win. And, and the expenses, as you can see on the right, are very, very high. Um, when, when a lawsuit's filed, you're going to be in the six figures even if you settle it, it's filed, and if you fight it at all. Highland up there, in the, the fourth one down on the right, they admitted liability and only argued about the remedy. And the remedy fight, they were ordered to pay plaintiffs a fees of $1.3 million. So that, it's those dollar figures that are driving this. It's not that anyone, it's going to districts is not an admission of any prejudice or discrimination or anything like that. It's just, uh, the statement that you have better things to do with your money than fighting court over this. 
So as was mentioned, this is just big picture. Um, the process is a couple of steps. First, we do have to do these two hearings, which are to get public input before we can draw any draft maps. Then we draw the draft maps. Um, we do have to post those seven days before the, the board can hold a hearing on them. There'll be two hearings and the, and the board adopts. Um, we're in a little bit of an odd situation as well, not just here, but all of the, um, Fifty jurisdictions adopting maps for 2020. The map will be used in 2020 for the number of board seats that are up that year. Then because of where we are in the decade, the, the 2020 census data will come out in 2021. And so every 10 years, you have to adjust your lines based on the new census data. It just so happens that that every 10 years is right around the corner. So the lines will actually be updated in 2021 before they're reused for the, the remaining seats in 2020. So the, the typical, well, the, the criteria that we use to draft maps are two sets. One is the federal laws. These are the requirements. So we have to have an equal population in each district. And that is human beings counted in the 2010 census. Again, it's late in the decade. It's really rare to be doing it this late, except under this law. Um, so it's not registered voters. It's not eligible voters or citizens or anything like that. It's human beings of all ages and, and uh, and citizenship status counted in the census. Then we have to follow the Federal Voter Rights Act, um, which really says that if there's a neighborhood that's heavily a protected class, um, then we can't divide that neighborhood in a way that dilutes their voting strength. And if it gets up to be you know, close to a, a large enough neighborhood where they could be a majority of, seat, of, of the voters in that seat, that's when it starts to trigger more concerns that uh, we'll address if, if we reach that point. So we do have to comply with the Federal Voter Rights Act, but you can go too far. The law also says no racial gerrymandering. So that's why I talk about if a protected class is a majority of a neighborhood. We want to focus on neighborhoods. Uh, you'll see in a second, I can put up a map that shows city block by city block, the estimated ethnic percentages. And if you essentially draw a line based on those colors, well then race is becoming what the court calls the predominant factor. And that's going too far. So race can be something you consider, and certainly will be. Um, but it can't be the predominant factor. We do want to focus on neighborhoods. So those are requirements, and your legal counsel and, and NDC will work to make sure that the maps that you uh, consider meet all those. Where the decisions come down is the list on the right, the traditional redistricting principles. So this is where we get communities of interest, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, trying to be compact, contiguous, and follow major roads. Those are all so that it's easy, well, relatively easy for voters to know where their boundaries are. If they want to go knock on doors for a candidate, you want to be able to tell friends, you know, let's go knock on doors from this major road to this major road rather than having to pick neighborhood by neighborhood. The equal population requirement makes that tough, but, uh, but it is something we aim for. And then respect voters' choices and continuity in office. Again, this is a, a traditional principle or a goal. It's not a requirement. But this is the idea that we want the voters to be able to decide which direct to continue, to be able to decide which directors have earned re-election. And if we put two or three or more board members in one seat, well then it doesn't matter what the voters think. Someone's not going to be able to get re-elected because of where the lines are. So to the degree possible within the other goals, we can take that consideration and try to avoid what we call pairings. And the last is kind of grayed out, the planned future growth. Um, when the lines are going to be in place for a long time, you can underpopulate the division that you think is going to grow the most and overpopulate the ones that you think aren't going to grow. As I mentioned, these lines will only be used in 2020. So we're not really looking at future growth between now and next year. When we come back in 2021 and revisit the lines, those lines will be in place for 10 years. So that'll be a time when you may want to look at what growth patterns and, and try to uh, underpopulate to adjust for those. But I didn't want it to be a surprise in 2021 if, uh, when you hear about that. There's a lot of data. I'm not going to go through all this. but. Uh, for every division and every map that comes to you, we'll provide all of this data. So you get your total population on the top left. Your citizen voting age population, that's the Census Bureau's estimates of the eligible voters. And that's what the courts focus on to that Voting Rights Act compliance. So when we talk about a majority Latino or, or majority Asian American seat, that's what we're looking at is the citizen voting age population. But there's also turnout data. 
which is ballpark data. It's based on surnames, so it's kind of the best available data, but obviously it's far from precise. And then on the right is more your socioeconomic data that people are free to look at or not look at, depending on their interests. Everything from age to immigration, um, whether an immigrant or not, language spoken at home. I do want to highlight one interesting thing that has come up a lot in the last 10 years and didn't just come up. If you look at that language spoken at home category, note that 31% of the households are estimated to speak Spanish at home. But then if you go down a few lines, you get language fluency, speaks English less than